Okay. Okay. So uh, I am here with my coworker, Martin Robinson from Egalia, and we're going to talk about accessibility. Uh, we do a lot of accessibility related stuff at Egalia, and you've been doing some of that. So um, just to start us off, I think there's kind of an interesting challenge with accessibility because it is just like really foreign to a lot of us. Um, in almost every way, like how you think about how something should work is very shaped by like your own modalities and what you're used to using. And I also think that nobody kind of explains the big picture, like the architecture of how all of this works. Uh, we just talk about like a screen reader and we don't sort of talk about how it fits together. So um, I've seen a lot of uh confusion over the years that have to do with not understanding some of this i've even had some of my own so can you maybe explain some of the basic like architecture of it sure yeah uh, no problem uh i think that the most important thing to remember is that there's always uh at the end of at the end of a pipeline of accessibility technology there's always a user using a specific tool and then the entire accessibility stack is made to deliver information from the application to that tool so that the user can use the, the application. And one of the most important parts of that stack of technologies is this concept of the accessibility tree, which is an internal in-memory representation of the application, which allows the the accessibility tool to interact with the application and also to get information out from it. If people are familiar with, with for instance, a, a DOM tree, the accessibility tree can be thought of as something similar to that, but consuming the application interface. Is that sort of what you were going for there? It is, yeah. And And when you say application, you mean like, any application, right? Right. Like, um, it, an application like a web browser or a word processor or even the desktop shell that you're using will have a, a place in the accessibility tree. Will, have, will provide its own accessibility tree for the accessibility technology to consume. Yeah, that, that's really interesting to me because this is what I mean. Like, I, I think a lot of people, including myself at various times, I, I'm not really sure why. Um, I think it's because in the web, we, we talk about accessibility a lot. Um, but I guess I have ho always had this very, very strong correlation in my mind between something like a screen reader and a web browser and I never have pieced together how those two things would fit together and thought about the rather obvious seeming fact in retrospect that you use those screen readers for all of your applications, like your native spreadsheets and your native email clients. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. So how... How do those applications that aren't web browsers, um, how do they create that accessibility tree? Like, it really depends. Do they program? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, like, do they program? It really depends on the application. I think for the majority of applications, if you can imagine that they're written in a toolkit, like like GTK on on Linux, for example, or um, um, I want to say Cocoa, but <laughs> What I really mean to say is the the modern Mac OS uh, UI programming, um, right. uh, and then Win Win thirty two controls on on Windows. They all sort of have their own their own way of of exposing accessibility uh, objects to to screen readers and other accessibility technologies. Uh, typically, typically this is handled automatically by the toolkit. So if you write your application in GTK and you're not using custom widgets, it should just by default be accessible. The problem, of course, is that a web page is a piece of interface and it's unclear looking at any particular web page how that should be exposed to a, to a screen reader or to a, a braille display or something like that. Yeah, it's um, it seems pretty clear when you 
talk about like headings and paragraphs and things, mm-hmm. assuming that something is uh, well formed and follows good right. practices. Um, but uh, when we get to the interactive things, this is uh, very similar to the thing that you just said. Like if you're not creating custom mm-hmm. widgets, yeah, right? it's a it's a similar idea. If your web page is just a document with headings and paragraphs, then it's going to be exposed really nicely to a screen reader. But once you start adding images or more complex interface elements, a lot of web pages have these sort of elements. Just imagine Google Docs, for example. It's an entire application inside of a web page. And how do you expose the idea of a menu or or buttons, especially when they're not made with the typical uh, HTML form controls to the screen reader? Screen reader um, how do you provide that bit of um, contextual information? I think that's a point that we try to stress in the web platform itself too, right? Like there are lots of interactive right. widgets oh, and everything sure. that give you all that magic, right? The, the magic is, is a pro and a con because um, you don't have to worry about it, but because you don't have to worry about it, you're mm-hmm. also not aware of it. So uh, it's easy to like miss that. Right. Yeah. For example, uh, the button, the button element has a lot of built in accessibility support. And if you, for instance, create your own button just from a div or from an image or text, then it may not it may not be exposed in the same way to the accessibility technology as that original HTML form button. And that's the kind of thing that you you would miss by creating your custom your custom elements. It seems so easy. Like, I mean, what is a button? I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's like a right. thing that you click. <laughs> like at some level, that's true. But um, but there is a sort of a, a a bunch of hard work in that's wrapped up in a button and you get it all for free right, if you yeah. just use a button. Let me like recap uh, what I think is a simplified understanding. Um, mm-hmm. uh, your apps, uh, either directly or through some winnowing toolkit where somebody has done a whole lot of hard work to build, it, it builds and maintains this OS level tree, sort of like a DOM tree, but for accessibility. And it's not in the browser, it's at the OS level. And then some other app like consumes that and interacts with that. It's almost like uh, like client server communication. Yeah, that's correct. The uh, generally speaking, the way this works is that applications will expose the tree through interprocess communication to some sort of desktop wide broker that has all of these all of the trees of all the different applications, and then those can all be presented at once, perhaps through another set of interprocess communication to some sort of client application, a screen reader, a braille display, maybe an on-screen keyboard. And and that application will be consuming the trees through IPC of all the other, of all the applications of the desktop, a forest, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like you're saying through IPC, does it go in both directions? So like, can your accessibility app move the focus in this application or something for sure that is another huge um huge responsibility of the accessibility tree is to accept requests from accessibility technologies for like you said moving the focus another big one is activating so if you have a link or a button and the user wants to um, activate that Hmm. that button then the accessibility technology sends a, a message to the the application, which in, in this world is considered a server. The application is serving up the accessibility tree and taking requests from from clients, which are the the accessibility technologies. I feel like that kind of helps illuminate the um, some of the the stuff that's hidden from you because you look at it and you say, well, what is a button? It's just a thing that you can click. Like, what's so special about it? But um, it needs to create this accessibility tree and uh, also like receive events. And, and so like sort of the, the contract right. of these things is considerably more involved than you think. And if you don't meet some end of the contract, something won't work the same. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. 
That's um, exactly right. All right. So um, you had mentioned screen readers. I think they're the one that like everybody talks about. Um, our colleague Joni uh, and Egalia are the maintainers of one of those, the Orca screen reader for Linux. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> we do a lot of that as an investment. Uh, no, we, yeah. Like we we all together choose to take some of the money that we could put in our pockets, and we all contribute it back. Mm -hmm. I yeah, that's, think that's right. I think that's really awesome. I mean, right? Yeah. No, for sure. I, that's kind of part of our core core philosophy. I think. Yeah. You know, this is the first time I have had the opportunity to work directly with people who like work on the screen readers and like down in the ditches and. <laughs> Uh, to, like do do all the actual work on making that work and it never dawned on me it was kind of surprising for me to learn that like screen readers don't actually speak no <laughs> you think that they would read the screen but no they, they <laughs> from the name but no they don't right right yeah that's uh <laughs> do you want to like yeah. say something about like clear that up somehow sure yeah i think it's uh, it's important to to note that screen readers screen readers use speech speech subsystems to actually produce the actual audio of the spoken the spoken content. So on on Linux, for example, Orca uses a software called Speech Dispatcher by default. Although there are other speech backends, and then there are similar speech backends on other platforms, and Essentially, Orca can just send the text that it wants to speak to these APIs, and they'll actually produce the audio output. So text-to-speech is another, it's a whole other set of, of software and libraries. The speech, the screen reader sits on top of that. Yeah, that's that's another thing that's really fascinating to me. I, I know uh, you think it's your browser speaking, but it's... It's not your browser speaking, right? It's like the OS level thing that knows how to speak. Yeah. Okay. So there's this mystical accessibility tree at the operating system level. And um, we said it's kind of like the DOM, but like what's in it? Like that maybe sounds like a strange question, but as I understand, a lot of the concepts in ARIO were developed like based on these accessibility trees. And and that's that's another thing. Like, are they they're not are they the same tree in every operating system, or can they actually differ a little bit? No, they differ. They differ. They're very similar, but different platforms have different expectations of what should be exposed into these into these uh, desktop wide trees. So there is some degree of of difference. I would say the the, the vast majority of the contents are are quite similar. An example of what sort of thing is in the tree is, is for example, you look at um, it's just imagine a tree of of nodes, and each node can have children, and then certain properties on that node. One, probably the most important property of the node is the role, and the role basically gives some indication of what the what the purpose of that node is. For example, there might be a role label. For labels, role button for buttons. Uh, in in ATK, there's role panel for generic panel elements, and and that kind of tells the screen reader what the what the purpose of that uh, of that node is. Uh, another thing that each node might contain are states. Is this item focused? Is it selected? And then also attributes. For example. You can imagine a DOM attribute, which in include things like ID or style classes. Um, the accessibility nodes also have attributes. Yeah, that sounds a lot like ARIA. My understanding is that ARIA itself was sort of shaped based on these common concepts in different operating systems and sort of imagining how to provide a uniform way to express all this for the web platform with standard mappings to each one. Have I have I got that right? I think or? that's correct. So at least in my head, ARIA can be thought of as a, a platform independent version of platform accessibility tree and, and then can later be mapped onto the real platform accessibility tree. There's a, there's actually a series of, of specs that kind of track this, this layering. 
Um, the first one is W A I Aria, which defines Aria, um, and it doesn't say anything about how it how it maps onto the the platform APIs, but it sort of defines the basic concepts of what that kind of API looks like with roles and attributes and states and those sort of things. And then other specs will map that onto the platform APIs. So if you look at core AAM, which is the core um, accessibility API mappings, that spec actually tells you, well, on this platform, the this sort of ARIA node maps onto this sort of platform node. And then if you look further, you see that there's um, other specs such as HTML AAM, which is the HTML accessibility API mappings. And that sits sort of on top of both of those specifications. And what it does is it says, okay, here is an HTML element and implicitly it maps to this ARIA role and right beside it, it says it also maps to this platform accessibility tree role. So it sort of tells the whole story um, by referring to both of those specs. So it really helps sort of stitch them together in, in these layers. Um, yeah, there's a lot of accessibility specs. Um, there's also uh, the uh, ARIA authoring practices, which is great if you um, are a developer, because ARIA also contains uh, like patterns for controls that have no current parallel in HTML, like tab sets and accordions. And yeah, that's like right. That. Uh, where the HTML AAM provides implicit mappings for already existing HTML elements. If you want to create your own more complicated um, pieces on on your on your page, then the the ARIA authoring guide is a great way to see how some of those should be represented um, in ARIA. So the browser is just another one of these apps, and it has to build and map its accessibility tree, and uh, that's complicated. Um, you have uh, ARIA and the um, the mappings to the operating system level thing, but then to create that, um, you you can't even just look at the DOM, right? Like it's more it's more complicated than that, right? That's that's right. Uh, if you take the example of CSS gener generated content, for instance, um, uh, before using before to produce content that goes before a particular CSS selector, um, uh, content selected with this particular CSS selector, that content isn't in the DOM, but it is useful for it to be exposed in the accessibility tree. So essentially the accessibility tree needs to be built based on the combination of the DOM with the CSS. Display none, right? Like if it's display none, it we can't have mm -hmm. it be in the tree or For else sure. uh, that would be bad. And, and mm -hmm. a, a number of things are implemented ef like effectively that way, right? Like they're just hidden from display. So you wouldn't mm -hmm. want your document to right. read the head of your Right, like you, you don't want reading the text of script elements. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, right. All right, so we work on all kinds of stuff in this space in more than one browser, right? Well, looking at the specifications, we're involved in in many of the specifications in the editing process. Mm -hmm. um, we're also involved in the implementation. Uh, focusing mainly on the Linux desktop, um, but also with other desktops as well. A lot of our work is focused, though, on Linux desktop, implementing the accessibility uh, support for ATK and ATSVI2. Um, we were working in the three major browsers, Chromium, Gecko slash Firefox and uh, WebKit. When it comes to accessibility on Linux, it would be safe to say that Egalia is a strong, uh, strong ally. Yeah, I think that's safe yeah. to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of looping back, like as I said in the very beginning, it's 
it's very hard for a lot of us to um, like even relate to how things should work. Uh, like I'm not the first person to say that if you like just give like a developer who has never experienced a screen reader before um, and ask them like your site isn't accessible. Here's a screen reader. Go fix it. Um, like a lot of their intuitions turn out to be wrong, making it worse instead of better. Even if you really know what you're doing, ARIA can be pretty complicated, right? That's why I think the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA. Um, <laughs> can you can you maybe talk about that a little bit or something? Yeah. So I guess I can point to an example of of how this is this is tricky to get right. Um, we've run into issues where people have tried to create something as simple as a button, and they perhaps create an element, an HTML element, and give it the button role, but then they don't allow it to respond to not responding to keyboard events. So, so say that you um, you create a button where if if the user is able to to mouse over that button and click it, it, it works just fine, but it's not focusable, so it's uh, it's impossible to actually activate it with the keyboard. Mm-hmm. Screen readers, uh, at least Orca, is smart enough to to notice when that's happening, and it will try to to click on it, but only if everything is set up properly on the client on the in the client code. So. Once you start going down these paths, it's really easy to get into a situation where the screen reader is just not going to know how to operate on your custom element. And that, that's the kind of trouble you can get into when you start using Orca, or sorry, using Aria without without setting up the elements in a proper way. The, the thing is, nowadays, um, screen readers are, are very similar to, to web browsers in that they, they're they're built to deal with bad authoring, and they have a lot of workarounds to make that to make that happen. Um, to some extent, that's sort of the the life that you that you take on when you work on a screen reader. You you have to deal with the web that exists, not the one that you um, that you really want to. So so I think from the from our perspective as implementers, um, things like that, it's it's just that if there's something that you have to work around, you have to work around it. Um, because at the end of the day, it, it has to, the software has to work. If the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA and, um, it can be complicated, like who should use ARIA? The way I've looked at this in the past, um, is that ARIA is low level things and they're not for the average author. The, the goal of the platform is to make it so you don't have to use that and, Aria is then like an escape hatch for when the platform isn't meeting your needs. I think that's a good a good way of describing it. So, like in in some ways, in, in theory anyway, it it's really good because um, different people can sort of centralize their work and they can make like a compo- a suite of components um, that yeah, can have yeah, all these right. accessibility characteristics and. Uh, that's great. Um, but we also don't have native equivalents of some of those. Um, and, uh, the ones that we have, uh, as we say, like people have to turn away from them too quickly. Um, so part of me is wondering if you have any thoughts on like, how did it get that way? Like, how do we wind up here? There are these, these sort of two worlds the web platform in- implementers and then web developers. And it's really surprisingly rare that there's a big overlap between those two. So a lot of times it's really difficult to know exactly what web developers need or what they're missing, which is why I think this communication between these two groups is really important. It's a really hard thing to resolve. And I bring it up because I wanted to mention some new efforts at this and get your thoughts on them. So I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Nicole Sullivan at Google and Greg Whitworth at Microsoft are sort of spearheading some efforts to um, 
study why people don't use those elements and and we know plenty of reasons already but um and and how to fix that uh so to make form controls more stylable and, and things like that so that people don't find an excuse to go pop the escape hatches right away so i don't know have you seen that what do you think about it um i haven't but that i mean that sounds great i feel like that would go a long way toward toward relieving some of these situations uh that pop up yeah there's uh there's lots of things in the platform where you currently have to uh turn to escape hatches and also those escape hatches are like pretty comparatively low level um there's even sort of intermediate things that um we can do to greatly improve like the complexity of a whole bunch of use cases and, and make it easier to get things right that aren't even uh, just components, um, things that make components possible and easier to develop. Yeah, at the end of the day, if it requires a huge development team of experts to get accessibility right in order to build a web application, then we as providers of the web platform need to do a better job of making it really easy to get accessibility right. Even when you're building these custom widgets, if they're actually required for, for building modern web applications. Yeah. So I think that you're totally right that the, the responsibility for making this work really lies with us and not with millions of web developers who don't have years of experience doing yeah. accessibility. I really, really like the... Um the the sort of nuance in what you're saying um that a lot of times like historically these communities are sort of like at odds with one another um like the design community and the accessibility community and um our friend alice boxhall who uh, works at google um she is on the w3c tag now and in her candidate statement it stuck with me she said um like developers you know they want their things to be accessible. It's not that they don't want them to be accessible, right? Mm -hmm. It's just currently very hard. And if we right. make it hard to do the right thing, very few people will do the right thing. So we have to find ways to lower the barrier. Yeah. No. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, but uh, have you had any thoughts around like, um, or do you have any thoughts on like what element should HTML have that it just doesn't have? And that makes it really difficult for a lot of author. I mean, I think from the perspective of accessibility, the most important thing is that when we add things, there has to be from the beginning, a story around how they interact with accessibility technologies. And the days of creating controls without actually taking into consideration screen readers and people using them, um, that just has to be in the past because the web is too big and too important to leave people behind. So so I think that large or, uh, corporations proposing things, they, they really need to, they really need to make their proposals with those considerations. Yeah, I think, Getting, getting people to agree on any of these things is like really, really hard. And uh, historically, this has been uh, like really based on love, talk and debate. And then at the end of a really long process, we give people something. And the question is, did we get it right? Okay, so... Um, Thanks for taking the time and talking with me, Martin. I, I appreciate I appreciate it. Uh, I learned a lot in, in this, actually, and uh, I found it sort of informative and useful. So thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Bye.